Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Uh, just remember, this is now a device-free zone for the next 75 minutes. Um, let's talk a little bit about where we are and where we're going. Um, we are going to complete lecture 10 uh, momentarily. We have one or two more slides there, and that will complete our minimal cognition Olympics, and we will move on to a two-part lecture series uh, in locomotion. Before we do that, um, just to get oriented in terms of the assignments, so undergraduates, you're starting on uh, assignment six. So you're now going to, between now six and assignment 10, you're going to be building a series of search methods, and you finished in assignment five with the simplest possible search uh, method you can imagine, create a gazillion random solutions, measure the quality of each of those, and the best one is the winner. Right? So we're going to build up some more and more uh, high-powered search methods as we go between assignment six uh, and 10. For the graduate students, uh, since you've been doubling up on assignments, you should now be done uh, all 10 uh, assignments. So just uh, a little bit of a hint for those of you that have finished assignment 10, which is the photo taxis uh, assignment, you might have noticed that photo, uh, photo taxis is tricky. Anybody manage to evolve a robot that can approach all four of the light sources? That gets four out of four. Rachel's getting close. Okay, good to hear. Very difficult to do. Uh, in that final, in that tenth and final assignment, we are not looking for you to evolve a robot that can approach all four of the light sources. All we want to see is the rudiments of phototaxis. So, what is the rudiments of phototaxis means? If you take your robot and you place four different light sources one after the other and the robot does exactly the same thing in all four environments, that's not phototaxis. Perhaps evolution has sort of turned off the photo sensor and the robot just does the same thing regardless of where the light is placed in its environment. What we're looking for is that evolution has started down the road to phototaxis. So the robot kind of approaches the light when it's placed in front and maybe it kind of approaches the light when the light is on its left and completely fails when the light is on the right or the light is behind it. At least it's the beginnings of phototaxis. That's all that we're, we're looking for. Question? Yes, so I managed to get, uh, this, I guess it's kind of difficult to tell, but two okay. and three okay. Out of the directions. Okay. Um, two out of the four directions? Yep. Okay. Two to three out of the four. Oh, two to three out of the four. Okay, that's pretty good. Um, but if I had let it run for more generations and yes. chosen a bigger population size and maybe let the algorithm, the um, simulation run longer, do you okay. think I would have, it would have been, is or is it still kind of that? Okay, that's a good question. So if you had run it for more generations, if you had a larger population size, you could also increase the length of the evaluation period, the eval time. Um, the answer is I don't know. And we never know. This is, evolu this is an evolutionary process. It's stochastic. So you could run it for 10,000 more generations and not see an increase in fitness of your best solution in the population. And on the 10,000 and first generation, now there is an improvement. It's hard to say, right? So um, that's a good question because the point of the final assignment, assignment 10, is not the end, but it's the end of the beginning. Now you can start to think about all the things that we're going to talk about in this class that might improve phototaxis. So that's one path you can follow in the final project, is sort of tackle what can you do to get a robot to be robust, meaning it does what you want it to do, which in this case is approach the light in many different environments. So we're going to talk about a lot of different aspects as we continue on of things that might help you with, with phototaxis. Alternatively, when you get to the end of uh, assignment 10, you might take your phototacting robot, put it aside, and evolve the robot to do something else. It's really uh, up to you. Um, there are things you can do on the evolutionary algorithm side, like uh, run it for more generations, increase the population size. My first suggestion is to um, remove the genetic algorithm and go back to the parallel hill climber. As some of you might have noticed in assignments 8, 9, and 10, the genetic algorithm sometimes uh, is less powerful than the parallel hill climber. For those of you that have got that far, anyone notice that? Any idea why that might be? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. It seemed like the parallel hill climber tended to ratchet up the religious um, landscape a 
quicker at a higher rate. Than so, the than the genetic algorithm. Yeah, the genetic al algorithm would run for like okay. a few generations and then tick up and then maybe do like three ticks up, but not very okay. much. And they all tended to be tended to be pretty low. Okay. That's, that's a good observation. So, so most of you are not there yet, but when you get there, you're going to be looking at the parallel hill climber in 8 or 9, and then the genetic algorithm in 9 or 10, or whatever it is. The reason that the parallel hill climber sometimes does better than the genetic algorithm is that the parallel hill climber maintains diversity in the population. Right? This holds true for artificial populations like our robots and also for biological populations. When diversity disappears from the population, often the population is in trouble. So the genetic algorithm, at least the one you're implementing in the assignments, is initially quite weak because it does not maintain diversity in the population. Simplest way to deal with that is just to go back to the parallel hill climber and sometimes that helps. Later in the course, we'll come back to talking about how to maintain diversity in the population. But we haven't got there yet. So increasing the number of generations and population size can help. But the real thing you want to try and do is keep lots of different solutions in the population. <clears throat> yes? So I did tend to notice that as okay. it went further, they, they changed less. That's and right. They were smaller increments. And you also said that the, in the notes that the, popular, the parents were all from the same lineage. Exactly. So if those genes get fixed in the population, is you're in trouble, right? Yeah, so is the, you could probably do some sort of mutation at an interval, maybe, that disrupts the, the um, genetic diversity. Uh, possibly. So again, we're, now we're discussing ways in which you could maintain diversity in the population, and there's lots of different ways to do that. Gene flow. Gene, all sorts, exactly. So if you know your biology, you know your evolutionary biology, there, there are mechanisms there that you might be able to build into your code to maintain diversity. For now, the simplest way to do it Go back to the parallel hill climber, and if you remember what the parallel hill climber is, is it's a set of parallel hill climbers. There is no, they're not genetically related whatsoever, right? An easy way to keep genetic diversity in the population. Okay, so let's just set that aside for the moment. That's assignment 10 in phototaxis. Um, for the graduate students, you are now going to start in on the final project, and you'll see now on the schedule, you'll start to appear uh, this acronym WR. This is written reports. So for the graduate students now, from now until the end of the semester, you're going to be submitting weekly reports that report on the, your progress on your final project. Undergraduates, you will get to your weekly reports in about uh, four weeks' time. So I just want to talk about the final project and the weekly reports now, um, since the graduate students are already there. Um, this document is now up and in Blackboard. Uh, you can go and find it there. This is all you need to know about the final project. So I'm just going to very briefly go over this document, and you can go and read this uh, at your leisure. So assessment of the final project is broken down into three parts, a series of weekly reports, and at the very end, an oral presentation and a written report. Um, the graduate students, because you're done now, you're going to be submitting one weekly report over the next nine weeks. So you're going to be submitting a total of nine weekly reports. Um, undergraduates, you're going to have four weeks at the end to work on your final project. So you're going to be submitting four weekly reports. Um, it says eight weekly liberal deliverables, but then we do the nine times two. Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> why is that the case? So there are nine weekly reports. The first weekly report is you're going to be describing what you're going to be doing in the following K weeks. So graduate students, next Monday, you're going to be sub submitting your first weekly report where you describe what you want to do for your final project. And you're going to break it down into what you're going to do over the following eight weeks. Make sense? That's why it's nine and eight or four and three. So, you, so the undergraduates, you're submitting uh, four weekly reports. The first one describes what you're going to do and the three weekly deliverables after that point. Yes? Uh, that is a good question. Uh, yes, it can be whatever whatever you want. Um, that is the point of the first weekly report is myself and the TA, when those are submitted, will work with you, given our experience with these weekly reports, what's doable in four weeks, or for the graduate students, what's doable in nine weeks. It's impossible to say. Um, what we usually say is pitch something that's ambitious, but break it down into X 
weekly bite-sized chunks. So as a general rule of thumb, we are not looking for you to win the Nobel Prize in this semester, and we're also not looking for you to change the, the mutation rate on the final project and see how well that does. That's about a half hour's worth of, of work, right? So somewhere in between is what we're looking for. And a good way to do that is, again, given hopefully you find something in this course that's of interest to you. You might want to try it in your final project. It may be overly ambitious. What we're looking for is at least you were able to take that final goal and break it down into a series of bite-sized chunks. If we get to the end of the semester and when you stand up here and give your oral presentation and you say, here is what I wanted to do at the end, here were the three weekly pieces that I had planned out in order to get there, I got through two of the three and the third one turned out to be more ambitious than I thought, I didn't implement the third one, that is still a successful final project. What is an unsuccessful final project is to say, here is the ambitious goal that I had, and I didn't really make any progress on it. I tackled it head on, and it crashed. It never worked. That's obviously not going to be a successful project. So the key to doing well in the final project in this class is pitch something that's interesting and ambitious, but spend a fair bit of time in the first week of the final project thinking about how are you going to sneak up on this on this task. You'll have some experience doing that through the 10 assignments. So for those of you that have reached assignment 10, you're now doing something which is pretty ambitious, which is legged locomotion towards light sources placed in the robot's environment. It's not an easy thing to do, but you're sneaking up on it by building the robot, building the evolutionary algorithm, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work, and so on. Okay. So um, there we go. So in the first week, you're telling us what you want to do and K uh, subtasks to approach it, which will give uh, either four weekly reports in total or nine weekly reports in total. The final project for everyone is worth 30%. Each weekly deliverable or weekly report is, is worth 2%. So for the uh, graduate students, um, uh, it's a total of 18% for the weekly reports, and for the undergraduates, it's a total of 8% for the weekly reports, 2% per week. Okay? Again, this is just there to help you keep on track that you're making progress towards your final project. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, here's where you can find them all. So in Blackboard, uh, in Blackboard now, in course materials, you'll find a new folder called Final Project, and all the weekly reports are in there. So that's where you submit. You submit as always at Monday, Mondays at 11:59 uh, p.m. After you've submitted the first weekly report, telling us what you're going to do, then the second through subsequent weekly report is proof to us that you've implemented the subtask that you proposed. Right? Um, when you get to the end of assignment 10, you're working with the quadruped. Some of you might want to tackle bipedal locomotion or two-legged locomotion. So your first task might be just to turn the quadruped into a biped. You might not get it to, to walk yet, but maybe that's what you're going to do in the first week. Right? So changing the objects and joints to turn the quadruped into a biped. So what we would be looking for in your second weekly report is a series of videos or screenshots where you gradually turn the quadruped into a biped. That would be a successful weekly report. Next week you might say, now that I have the biped, we're going to try and evolve for forward locomotion, and you might get a biped that falls forward and then shuffles along the ground to maximize your fitness function. It did what you wanted it to do, but it's perverse instantiation. You didn't get walking, but you got a biped that moves from point A to point B. If that's what you proposed for the second week, which seems perfectly reasonable to me, if you have a video of that, success. Week three might be combating perverse instantiation. So now you might uh, enrich your fitness function so that now you actually get a biped that starts to take a couple of steps before falling over. That's what we're looking for in these weekly reports. Make sense? Okay. All right. And then again, during the uh, exam period, you're going to you're going to submit a, wit a written report, which is here's proof that we, we that you implemented what you actually had in mind, or an explanation of why you got through three of the four uh, subtasks and weren't able to tackle the the fourth one. 
There will also be an oral presentation. We won't talk about the written report or the oral presentation yet. We'll do that as we get closer to the exam period. Um, I threw into this document links to a bunch of videos from projects from years past. These are just there for inspiration to kind of give you a feel for difficulty level um, things you might tackle. Again, you don't have to pick something from this list. This is just something there uh, for your inspiration. Um, you might also go and have a look at the robotics subreddit. There's always great crazy robots in there and some of them might be interesting ideas for a final project. Okay, so um, point number six here, I kind of already went over this, but just an example of what, of what a good deliverable looks like. Um, you might, for example, uh, want to create a wagged robot. So a wagged robot is a robot that has legs, and on the end of those legs are wheels. So wheels and legs have various pros and cons. If you build a wagged robot in the right way, you can combine the best uh, of both worlds. So your, written, your first deliverable might look exactly like this. I wish to create a wedge robot and test two hypotheses about it. So you might have specific questions you want to uh, answer. So for example, can a wedged robot do better than either wheels alone or legs alone? And then does, it, uh, does a wedged robot benefit from one or more wegs? So you can actually add more or less wegs on. So you've got two specific questions you might want to, to tackle. And then in that first deliverable, here is, at least for a graduate student, what they're proposing to do over the next eight weeks. And I won't go through all of those. You can read them at your leisure. But I chose these because I think these are, again, pitched at the right level of difficulty, at least for the grad students. Undergraduates, if you're feeling ambitious, this would be a good, good thing to tackle. Okay, again, we'll talk about written report and oral presentation as we get closer to the exam period. Any questions about the weekly reports? Yes? Question. It's yep. more of a project. Um, um, so it's something you might have to swarm idea. Um, yep. It could really be applied to multiple things. Uh, so I mean, my first thought for swarm thing is maybe have different roles going on or something like that. Okay. So if you have something like that, like if a team with a number of different roles, um, like what, is it okay if the team is itself is not subject to evolution or, or should it be? Uh, that's a good question. So should the evolution be in there? Uh, you, should be ha you should have an evolutionary algorithm in there somewhere, right? So this is not a robotics course. This is an evolutionary robotics course. So you might have a swarm of robots. You might hand code behaviors for some of the swarm. And for other members of the swarm, you're going to evolve behaviors. That would be perfectly fine. Yeah. Actually, when we get to the swarm part of the course, you're going to see exactly that. You're going to see a swarm in which some members are hand-coded and others are evolved. So evolutionary algorithms should be in there somewhere. That's a good question. Any other questions? Okay. Again, undergraduates, we've got a few weeks before we get there, but I think we're all on board about the final project. Okay. So let's get back to lecture material. Um, we'll finish off active categorical perception in a moment, but let's just talk about legged uh, locomotion. And let's start by posing a question. Why don't plants have brains? Unnecessary use of energy. Unnecessary use of energy. Animals have brains. That's a huge power, power drain. So we do it. We suffer brains, even though they're huge energy hogs. Why don't plants have brains? Because it's not necessary for them because they don't move around and really interact with their environment. Brains are not necessary for plants because they don't need to move themselves from point A to point B. They move quite a bit, but they don't move themselves from point A to point B, self-motion, at least not most of them. So this question has been around in neuroscience for a long time, and it helps to point out the fact that there is some, uh, there is some fundamental connection between movement and intelligence. The moment you are in an, uh, an environmental niche in which you need to move about in your environment, as we talked about when we talked about embodied cognition, the moment you move, the world around you, at least from your point of view, seems to move as well. Things become much more complicated the moment you start moving. So you need something to deal with all of that complexity. 
If you don't move, you don't need a break. But then, like, is a Venus flytrap more intelligent than an orchid? Ah, uh, good. Is a Venus flytrap more intelligent than, than an orchid? So now we're back to the question of what it means to be intelligent. So that's why I didn't ask you, are animals more intelligent than plants? Just which of the two has a brain? That's, we're going to leave it there for now, because again, we could go down this philosophical slippery slope of uh, are we showing animal chauvinism? Because of course, we're animals asking the question, so we must be more intelligent than plants. I don't know the answer to that question. All I do know is our side of the house has brains. The other side of the house does not. This thing up here evolved initially to help our distant ancestors move about and do what they needed to do as they moved themselves. That's the reason why we're going to spend a lot of time in this course talking about locomotion. It's an important part of intelligence. Ultimately, we want intelligent machines that do not move around, but we definitely know that there is this connection between movement and intelligence. That's where Mother Nature started. So if we want to build intelligent machines, Perhaps we should start there uh, as well. Okay, so we just talked about plants. Let's talk about sea squirts for a moment. This is another interesting species. Um, in the juvenile stage of sea squirts, um, they're motile, meaning they swim about um, in the ocean. They have brains. They need to avoid predators, find food, and all the rest. Um, when they transition from their juvenile to their adult form, sea squirts find a good piece of rock or coral, they latch onto it, and they never move again, and they digest their own brains. Again, they're huge energy drains. If you don't need a brain anymore, it's a great source of nutrition. They digest their own brains, not unlike professors that get tenure. Okay. It's an old, very bad academic joke, but you know, hopefully now you can appreciate it. Okay, so we'll get back to legged locomotion in a minute, but let's finish off our discussion on active categorical perception. Just to refresh your memory, we're dealing with this anthropomorphic uh, robot arm. It is trying to manipulate spheres and ellipsoids. Inside this robot is a C, T, or an N. Looks very familiar to lots of other neural networks we've seen by now, except for neurons 47 and 48. We're going to use those two neurons, or the robot is going to use those two neurons to tell us whether the object in front of it is a sphere or an ellipsoid. At every point in time, when we update the C, T, R, and N, there are two values that arrive at 47 and 48. If you think of those two values as two coordinates in a two-dimensional plane, as the robot manipulates the object, those two neurons trace a trajectory in the two-dimensional plane. Every time we place an object in front of the robot, it draws one of these trajectories. We take a bounding box and put it around all of the trajectories created by the robot when we put it in the presence of a sphere. We then take a second bounding box and put it around all of the trajectories that uh, arose when we put the robot in the presence of ellipsoids. And the fitness function, or at least F2, is trying to minimize the overlap between these bounding boxes. The reason why is because when we place a new unknown object in front of the robot, if it traces a trajectory, we want that trajectory to fall into one or other of the boxes, but not both. That's why we, don't, why we want those boxes not to overlap. And that's the robot's way of telling us if that trajectory falls within one of those two bounding boxes that that's a sphere or that's an ellipsoid, right? OK. We saw, we, I think we ended last time by looking at the videos of the robot actually doing this and visually watching this particular evolved ACP, this particular evolved active way of the robot categorically perceiving objects in front of it. It's hard to tell what the difference actually is, but it works. Okay. Um, in this experiment, they reported uh, three separate runs, and you can see that in all three runs, uh, eventually, they evolved C, T, and Ns that succeeded, got two out of two, which was the maximum uh, fitness score. So it got one point for placing its palm in contact with the object and keeping it there, and then it got an extra point for getting these two bounding boxes to not overlap. Okay. This is what the best evolved controller does 
when exposed to a whole bunch of other conditions that were not seen during evolution. So remember back in lecture nine in our minimal cognition Olympics, we saw a lot of these kinds of plots. We got, we evolved something that works and we now want to try and understand how it works. Remember that during evolution, the robot only saw, quote unquote, 16 objects. It was actually just two objects, but each of those objects were placed at different, four different orientations, and the arm was started in two different initial conditions. So from the robot's point of view, there were 16 objects. Let's now give that single evolved CTRN 360 new objects. And again, they're not new objects. They're just the same two objects, but placed in slightly different situations. Let's start with the uh, gray bounding box at the top. So this is the bounding box associated with uh, spheres. They took the sphere and they rotated it 180 times, so 180 angle increments. And rotations are in scare quotes because you can't rotate a sphere, right? It looks exactly the same regardless of how you rotate it. You'll notice that for each of those 180 rotations, there were two clusters of smaller bounding boxes. And remember that those smaller bounding boxes are being placed around a single trajectory drawn by neurons 47 and 48. Why are there two clusters? What do these two clusters correspond to? So it definitely does know the difference between spheres and ellipsoids at this point because the larger uh, dashed boxes, the one at the top, the gray dashed box, that's the sphere bounding box. And the black dashed, uh, the black dashed uh, box down here, this is the bounding box around all of the ellipsoids. The small gray, uh, small gray boxes are when the sphere was presented to the robot, and most of those gray boxes <laughs> fall within the bigger gray box. So the robot is doing the right thing. It knows that those objects are actually spheres, and they are spheres. The fact that all the black smaller boxes, or most of them fall within the big black box, says the robot also knows what an ellipsoid is. So most of the time in these 360 cases, the robot is getting things correct. There are a few exceptions. Look at this black box out here. What, is, what happened in this case? It's a small black box, so which object did we present to the robot? It's the ellipsoid. So the ellipsoid was placed in front of the robot, and neuron 47 and 48 traced a trajectory that has this bounding box. What is the robot telling us about that object? It doesn't know, right? That box fell outside of, the, of both big bounding boxes. So the robot says, I don't know what this object is. So it got that one wrong. It was an ellipsoid and it didn't know it. What about this box here? So it's a small black box, which means we placed an ellipsoid and we rotated it to some initial orientation. The robot manipulated it, manipulated it. And what did the robot tell us? It's a sphere, right? The, ro the robot thinks this is a sphere, so it got that one absolutely wrong. So most of the time, 98 or 98, 98 or 99% of the time, when we place a sphere or ellipsoid in front of this controller, this CTRNN, it's correct. But a few of them it gets wrong, which is yet another reminder that evolution gets things right most of the time, but not 100% of the time. This isn't an optimal <coughs> solution. This is worrying if you're an engineer, but perhaps in some situations, 98 or 99 percent of the time, success rate is okay. All right, so that's what this picture means. We can see that most of the time it's getting it right. We can see that in the, t let's go back to the original question, in the sphere bounding box, most of the time when we place spheres in front of it, those bounding boxes are sort of in two clusters. What do you think those two clusters correspond to? Well, it thinks that there's some 
difference or some difference in the starting position? Was the arm placed in exactly the same orientation every single time? Was the arm placed in exactly the same orientation every time? It's good that you asked that question. That's what the clusters should remind you of. Remember that the arm started in two different initial conditions. So when they were placing those 360 spheres in front of the robot, sometimes they started the robot's arm in position A, and sometimes they started it in position B. That's what the two clusters represent. Now remember that these are spheres. So they're placing the sphere at different horizontal orientations, but a sphere is rotationally symmetric. So from the robot's point of view, those are exactly the same objects. So why don't we get two groups of bounding boxes which are stacked right on top of one another? Why are they spread around a little bit inside these clusters? This is a more tricky question. You're all becoming experts on physics engines now. You might be able to hazard a guess. Not moving the same way every time. It's, it's definitely not moving the same way every time, right? So we take uh, the arm in position A, we put a sphere underneath it, and it does its thing. We take the object away, we put the arm back to position A, we take exactly the same object. And if it's the sphere, we rotate it, but it's still uh, exactly the same object, run it again, and the arm moves slightly differently. Why? There's two possible explanations. I don't think they talk about it in the paper, but either the physics engine is not perfect, and some physics engines are not deterministic. They don't always do exactly the same thing. I think they also put a little bit of noise on the sensors. So this is another common trick in robotics, which is in the real world, you're never going to get exactly the same stimulation twice. Remember our, our Greek philosopher Heraclitus who said 2,000 years ago, man never enters the same river twice. Right? The world around us is always slightly changing. So even with simulated robots, sometimes roboticists will put a little bit of noise on the sensors in case we want to try and transfer this solution from simulation to reality. So again, they don't mention in the paper, but I'm pretty sure that's why they get a little bit of blur in these two, these two groups. Okay. So we can kind of understand what's going on with the spheres. With the ellipsoids, not so easy. We don't see these two clusters, even though uh, the arm is started sometimes in position A and sometimes uh, in position B. And now we have an ellipsoid. So now for different orientations, the robot is actually going to feel something that's different. Why is the black box bigger than the gray box? The fitness function said nothing about what the size of the bounding boxes should be, just that they should not overlap. Why is one bounding box bigger than the other? Uh, there might be more um, little snapshots, I guess, that you would get from the sensors at the ellipsoid, just due to like the, the variety of the positions it could be. Exactly. Um, See that? That would make sense. Absolutely. That's exactly it, right? So we're talking about active categorical perception. You're actively interacting with two different objects. Ellipsoids themselves have more variety in terms of their local curvatures. They're a more interesting object. There's more going on, which means typically, regardless of how the robot manipulates ellipsoids or spheres, there's a wider range of motions that occur when the hand comes in contact with the ellipsoid than it does with the sphere. And if there is a wider range of actions, generally speaking, that means that there is going to be a greater diversity in the movement of the trajectories of neurons 47 and 48, which ultimately leads to a bigger bounding box. So we're peering inside the brain of this robot and actually getting to understand something about how this robot sees or senses the world. For the robot, there is a wider range of experiences that are associated with ellipsoids than there are with spheres. We didn't evolve that. We didn't explicitly tell it to make the black box bigger than the gray box. That just fell out of the experiment. They ran the experiment three times. They did three independent evolutionary trials. 
And if you actually look at the three, you'll see the same thing. In all three trials, these are independent evolutionary events. The final best uh, controller, or the second best, or I'm sorry, I misspoke. These are from uh, the second run, and they show the best, second best, and third best controllers from run two. So these three guys are all genetically related, but they are not genetically related to the best controller from run number one. And for all four of these neural networks, the black box is bigger than the gray box. Sort of makes intuitive sense. You can actually notice in, for example, this one here, the gray box is very, very small. So this robot's subjective experience, if you like, of spheres is very, very constrained. Question? Oh, best in terms of fitness. So sorry, when, I, when we say the best controller, the second best, we were talking about the most fit, the one with the second highest value of F, and so on. It got uh, it got uh, it's uh, it got it right most of the time, and these two bounding boxes don't overlap, right? Oh, it looks like we did overlap. Almost overlap, but not quite. Oh, you're looking at the right side of it. This one here. So this is the bounding box for uh, ellipsoids, and this is the bounding box for spheres. And in the top picture, the top right one. Top right one. Is it, is it uh, so, oh, so they're, um, light, we're, yeah, they're light gray boxes here and black gray boxes. We're looking for no overlap between the gray and the black bounding box. The dash lines are not the solid. Yes. Now this is, you're right, this is a little confusing because there should only be one dashed box. I'm not sure why they have multiple <coughs> dashed boxes. That doesn't make sense. You're right. They don't overlap, however, so I guess they're pretty close. I'm not sure why they have multiple, but there should be just one. Point is that none of them overlap, which means you've got optimal fitness, right? You're the, and then uh, we can notice that the gray box is smaller than the black box. Question? For that third best of all one, yep. is, it, is it more or is it like at least to my eyes, it seems more like the black box is very, very big compared to the gray box being small. It almost looks like the gray box is a normal size compared to the other. Oh, if you're looking at the scale, you're looking yeah. at the scales, right? Whereas so, that black one just looks absolutely gigantic on that scale. Okay, so this is a good point. This is poor scientific practice. All of the axes in all of these panels should have the same range because you're right. Now, it's hard to visually compare the sizes of these bounding boxes from one controller to the, the other. Maybe you can mentally simulate it, but it's hard to, hard to say. Remember that, again, the size doesn't, size doesn't matter, but it is kind of interesting. OK, let's come back now to why they actually uh, why they actually treated neurons 47 and 48 this way. Much simpler thing would have, would have been to just say, if 40, the value of 47 is greater than 48, it's a sphere. If 48 is greater than 47, it's an ellipsoid. Right? They did not do that. And the reason they didn't do that is because they want this to scale up. They don't want to create grandmother cells. Neurons that have one and only one purpose, which is to light up whenever you see, think about your grandmother. It's too specific, right? It's not a good use of neural real estate because there are lots of things that you recognize uh, in the world around you, and we only have enough real estate to fit within our skull, so we want to try and do things in an efficient manner. Let's imagine, and this is a good way to, to test yourself to make sure you have an intuition for how these experiments work. Let's imagine you were going to continue this experiment. You're going to now place spheres, ellipsoids, and rectangular solids in front of the robot at different orientations. And you're going to train it to recognize or distinguish or categorize these three different objects. What changes do you need to make to this experiment to make that happen? We need to make changes in a few places. One of them is obviously the physics engine itself. We're going to have to place rectangular solids as well as spheres and ellipsoids. Where else do we need to make changes? We need to add... 
ideas. In the spirit of this experiment, there's one thing we don't want to do, which is add neuron 49, right? We want to try and keep the neural real estate the same. We're going to try and pack some more intelligence into this, this brain. Where do we need to make changes? Yes, your fitness function, I think, has, is looking for overlap between the ellipsoid and the sphere. You have to also make sure it doesn't overlap. Exactly. So we'd have to elaborate F2 here and look for, um, and try and minimize overlap between each of the three pairs of bounding boxes. Spheres and ellipsoids, ellipsoids and rectangular solids, rectangular solids, and spheres. You might also need to relax the constraint that the palm has to be on the object because of the, or at least the center of the palm. Uh, it might be difficult, more difficult to get the center of the palm onto a surface of rectangular solid. Right, That's especially if you roll it, it might come off, which is a valid That's case. a good point. Yeah, we might have to relax F1 a little bit. Right. Okay, so with those few changes, that should be enough so that now we should get a picture that looks like this, where now we're going to have a gray bounding box, a black <coughs> bounding box, and a red bounding box for are rectangular solids, right? And none of those three boxes should be overlapping. Let's add uh, prisms. Now we've got four objects, right? We do the same thing, make a change to the physics engine, make a change to F2 in the fitness function, and maybe make a change to F1. How many objects could we pack into this CTRNN? How much capacity does it have? Trick question because nobody knows, right? Hard to say, right? We, we, it might be just something to, to try. The experimenters are probably hoping that you can get quite a few in there um, before things start to break down. That's categorization. Yep, did you have a comment? So what... How many, so given this computational effort, as you can see, they ran their experiment for 500 generations with a population of however many CTRNNs they had. For that computational budget, in all three cases, they ended up with a CTRNN that could correctly categorize spheres and ellipsoids, at least for the objects it saw during evolution. It got two out of two. It got the best possible fitness score you can get. So that's what I mean by success here. So if we went to three objects, and depending on how you define F2, let's imagine F2 can now range between 0 and 3 for our three objects. And with the same computational budget, can we still get evolve a CTRNN that gets 3 out of 3, that correctly cat distinguishes between the three different object types for this computational budget? How many more objects could we add for that still to hold up? It seems that... Need to, at some point, you, need, you would need to start increasing the number of neurons in the uh, neural network, and it would somewhat depend on how similar the objects are. That's it. So um, the AI labs at Google, most of the time, that's the question they're trying to tackle. What is the number of neurons we need in order for our search engine or our recommender system or our robot to succeed in what we want it to do? It's very hard to derive an answer to that analytically. Usually, we just do it empirically. We throw a whole bunch of computational effort at the problem, and do we get a solution or, or not? Yes? So if you added a neuron 49, but yep. you use it to actively categorize just some object, like a grandmother, okay. um, you would have three-dimensional space. So you can, it's kind of like a discriminative analysis on like a statistic. You oh. get more groups of separation. You stole my thunder. That was going to be my next question. Exactly. That's all right. If we added a neuron 49, now we're drawing a trajectory in three space, right? Now, why would we want to do that? I, you already answered your own question, but let me just walk us through that. If you look again at these pictures, you'll notice that the two bounding boxes tend to be very close to one another. The only thing we asked evolution to do is not have them overlap. Why aren't these two bounding boxes very far from one another in this neural two-dimensional space. They always tend to be right up next to one another. 
Why? Um, well, you don't have that much space. I guess graphically, you don't have that much space to depict if the fitness is going to be between zero and one, right? And then also, the fitness between zero and one. But remember, we're drawing um, in a two-dimensional space that's defined yeah. by the values of the two neurons, and those two neurons. We're using um, the, uh, the we're using actually not the tangent we're using the sigmoid function here it's in here somewhere we're using the sigmoid function here so the value of the output the value of the output of neurons 47 and 48 they can range between zero and one so these trajectories can be drawn in a two-dimensional plane that is anchored at 0, 0, and 1, 1. But that doesn't usually occur, right? It, they're, they're clumped much closer to one another. Why doesn't it spread out and use this space? Why aren't these two bounding boxes far from one another? You're going to widen your space because we're selecting for things that have non-overlapping boxes, right? So they definitely need to be pushed apart. But it looks from this picture like left to their own devices, they would like to overlap, right? It takes effort to push them apart, which doesn't make sense, or at least on the surface doesn't make sense. You could place them anywhere within this 0, 0 to 1, 1 plane. Why are they tending to bunch up next to one another? Think again about not just the brain, let's escape from the Cartesian dualism trap. Think about the body as well. The robot is manipulating an object. That's ultimately where these values are coming from. Why are these bounding boxes up against one another? Uh, for, I mean, specifically like the hand sensors, and then like it's looking at two, not perfectly round, but two similarly round objects. And also, yeah, it looks over similar to the sphere. Um, the, the, sphere, the ellipsoid is super close to the sphere, right? They look visually quite close to one another, and if you were to grasp these objects with your eyes closed, they feel very similar to one another. So the electrical activity in your brain associated with interacting with that object, those patterns of, of electrical activity are probably going to be very similar to one another, which in this simple example translates to trajectories being close to one another in this two-dimensional plane. So let's say we had a cube and a sphere. Uh, Would it not? It looked like on the graphic uh, of the boxes it was creating, like it still kind of tried to formulate all the, like at least something in all parts of the plot, right? Like, possibly. So is it not just trying things for the sake of seeing, you know, is there, a, you know, is there a hill over here, or is this the peak? Maybe, what, what is it actually doing when it manipulates an object, right? So you mentioned cubes or maybe rectangular solids. What would happen, again, let's do the thought experiment, not the actual experiment, about adding, adding cubes or rectangular solids that are placed at different uh, orientations. What kind of bounding boxes would you get from those three kinds of objects, generally speaking? You might have trouble because the block might slide, which kind of seem like a sphere to it. Maybe, depending on, it depends on what it actually chooses to do. But that is a good point, because the motion is pretty similar when it's testing, so that would tend to give you some possible bugs as well. Yeah, if you go back and watch the videos, and at least for these two objects, it was kind of lazy, right? It would just kind of roll its palm towards itself. What would happen in the presence of a, of a, of a cube? The ellipsoid and the sphere might cluster more. The sphere and the ellipsoid would close would tend to be very close to one another, right? Because they are similar to one another, right? The cube might feel or is likely to feel very different to the robot compared to the other two categories. So I'll bet you just looking at random CTRNNs, even before evolution. The red box, which is going to be the boundary box around the cubes, is probably going to be further from these two bounding boxes. It would probably be easier for evolution to push the red box away from these two than it is to push these two bounding boxes apart from one another. Isn't that kind of subjective to how the robot figures it out? Because if it was determining it was an ellipsoid because it had a, like a 
you know, different curvatures in all the spheres, yep. then maybe the prism is closer to the ellipsoid than the sphere is. That's a great question. Isn't this subjective, right? Absolutely it's subjective. But we've made, a, a, we've made some progress in building intelligent machines because now we're talking about subjective from the robot's point of view, which is good, right? That's what we want. So for us, if I was to, before we even started this particular lecture, if I showed you these objects, these objects, and rectangular solids and asked you which of these three doesn't belong, most of you probably would pick the rectangular solids. For us, rectangular solids are further from these two, subjectively, for us. Not everyone would agree, but most people, if you were to do this, would say yes. The question is, does the robot see the world the same way we do? But that's like a nurture trait. Possibly. Right? Like societally, we, we, have, we in math class, right, we change curved objects in linear things, or straight lined objects. So like... And why do we do that? Why does that occur in math class? There is a great book called Where Mathematics Comes From, which is an embodied cognition approach to understanding mathematics. And we don't have time to get into that here, but the thesis in that book is that the reason that happens is because these objects feel similarly to a, more similar to us than rectangular solids do. Could that be kind of a double-edged sword? Since the goal of this algorithm is to minimize within group separation and maximize between group separation, yep. in the presence of a cube, is it possible that the sphere and the ellipsoid would be so close to each other that we try to minimize that difference and just make two separate categories? Uh, possibly, but again, as long as we're actively selecting to keep the sphere and ellipsoid boxes apart as well, and assuming that evolution can do it, we're still good. You're right. There may be. It might be. It may want to clump together spheres and ellipsoids and say they're so similar to each other relative to the rectangular solids that I'm going to bunch them up. But evolution says, oh no, you're not going to, and it's going to try and push them apart as well. So now we're not just talking about. Now we're not just talking about whether these bounding boxes overlap or not, but the relative distances between them. This bounding box is closer to this bounding box than the red bounding box is. The reason we're spending so much time talking about this is this is the beginning now of trying to understand this robot's intelligent behavior. Right? So if we were to ask the robot, again, if we did this experiment with spheres, ellipsoids, and rectangular solids, which of the three doesn't belong? Its answer to that question has to do with the pairwise distances between the three bounding boxes. If one bounding box is much further from the other two, the robot would say those objects are more different than these two objects are. That's the one that, that's the odd object out. Right? For us intuitively, and again maybe because of nurture, but most of us would just say rectangular solids are more different than these two. Probably the robot would say the same thing even before evolution. Why would it say that? Because it has a similar and an, an arm to us, it's got touch sensors. If it were to place that thing, its hand, on those objects, it would probably feel more different. You'd get more different signals out of 47 and 48 than you would if you gave it a sphere or an ellipsoid. Okay, so that's called a semantic similarity. So which of these objects doesn't belong? So just based on the semantics or the meanings of these objects, how are they related to one another. You could send out surveys to a whole bunch of people and ask them those kind of questions and produce a network where the nodes represent different objects and the length of the edges between nodes represents how different people thought those objects are from each other. You can make that picture for one person, ten people, a thousand people. Does that picture look different from what a robot might spontaneously create? Or alternatively, if we want to create autonomous yet safe machines, machines that see the world the same way we do, make this picture look like the picture you get back from surveys you send to people. Robots should be able to look at objects out there in the world, like trees and pedestrians and road markers, and tell you which are similar and which are different from one another, which are more important, which are less important. Which is it okay to run over? Which is it not okay to run over? 
We want to make sure that the machines see the world through the same, in the same way that, that we do. Okay, obviously that's not what they're tackling here, but just here's one way to not only get machines to do some component of intelligent behavior, ACP, but a mechanism by which we might push robots to see the world in the same way we do. Last point about this lecture, you said we could add Neuron 49 and, produce, and create this in a three-dimensional space. It might be that in just 2D, we can't get all the bounding boxes to be the same relative distance from one another as they are for people. So we might need to add an additional dimension, which would make it easier for the robot to move some bounding boxes closer to one another and other bounding boxes apart. So there's a very specific hypothesis. How many of these categorization neurons do we need in order to train a robot to distinguish between objects in the same way that humans might? Okay, that's way beyond what I wanted to say for this lecture, but I think an interesting discussion to be had. Okay, so let's switch gears now, and we're going to switch and talk about, um, just go back to the schedule for a moment, legged locomotion. So now we're finished with our discussion of minimal cognition, and we're going to look at machines that are not minimal in the sense that they have self-motion. We just saw an arm which doesn't move itself about. We saw a very simple space invader, minimal cognition agents that all they could do is move from left to right. Let's place these robots in the real world, or at least a simulation of the real world, where, they need, where the laws of physics apply, and they need to get from point A to point B. Okay, so before we talk about bipedal locomotion or legged locomotion, let's talk about locomotion in general. And Mother Nature has come up with a huge, huge number of ways to get animals from point A to point B. Um, most of them are covered in one of my favorite books. This is by Alexander, Principles of Animal Locomotion. I'm going to pass this book around. You can flip through it if you like. We only have 15 minutes left, so I'll bring it back on Thursday. If you're interested in robotics, this is a must-have for your bookshelf. This is a snapshot just of the table of contents. And if you just look at the table of contents, you get a feel for all the different ways that Mother Nature has tried to solve the self-motion problem. Motion through the earth, through the modern, through the water, over the earth, over land, and in air. And there's lots and lots of different ways to do this. Why has Mother Nature come up with so many different ways to do this? One of them, of course, is that strategies that work in soil or in water don't work so well in land. Things that work on land don't necessarily get you in the air and vice versa. So there are good environmental reasons for why there are so many ways to get from point A to point B. The other less obvious reason is that any given locomotion strategy is trying to strike a trade-off between at least four competing demands. If you are trying to get about in your world and survive, find food, and find mates, you need to displace, you need to be able to move sufficiently fast, or you'll never get to the food or the mate. You need to be robust, and robust here means that whatever my locomotion strategy is, it works in surfaces other than that found in Culkin 004. I can also bipedally locomote out in the hall, on the stairs, thankfully today in mud and not over ice, that's robustness, right? Whatever strategy you have, it works in variations in whatever environment, environmental niche you inhabit, which for us is moving over firm ground. You also need to be able to do it in an energy efficient manner, obviously. And if we're talking about legged locomotion or strategies in which you're maintaining your center of mass up off the ground, you need to keep from falling over. Okay. All four of these are usually in antagonism with one another. Making one better tends to degrade another. Can you give me examples of where improving one um, degrades the other? So if you were you want a really stable robot, yep. you require more energy. Absolutely, right? So stability, if you want stability, you need a lot more energy. It also tends to slow you down. So a good way to stay stable is don't move too quickly. Other examples of trade-offs? Uh, people could take bird and give it bigger wings that can displace itself further, and it might be more stable, but it would probably take more energy. Absolutely. The, better, the easiest way to get faster is get bigger 
But the moment you get bigger, especially when you're in the air, there are much more there are more complicated energy demands and also maybe stability issues as well. Okay, so um, again, lots of different ways to do this. Um, this book that I'm passing around is great because it sort of starts with very simple things. Um, for example, peristalsis, which is a very simple mode of locomotion, often overlooked. You expand part of your body, and that expansion moves in a traveling wave backward, which causes you to move forward. Earthworms use this to move through the earth. Your throat uses this to swallow food. Um, peristaltic contraction of muscles. This was one of the original hacks that Mother Nature came up with when she discovered uh, muscle, and it exists in most animals at lots of different places in the body. Sometimes it's used for locomotion, sometimes it's used for other things. I showed you a brachiating robot already. Um, a beautiful way of getting around in an arboreal setting, if there's lots of branches. It's extremely energy efficient. Why is it energy efficient? You're using your own momentum, right? You're, ex you're, a you're, you're an embodied agent. You're exploiting the physics that act on your body to do what you want to do, which is move. If you ever go to the zoo and watch primates do this, they can do it very quickly. The primates in this room, you can get good at it, but nowhere near as good as uh, gibbons or orangutans. It's very energy efficient. It's very fast. It's not very robust. It works as long as there are enough branches around um, that you can get from one to the other. It doesn't work if the vegetation is too thick. So it restricts sort of the niche in which it works, but in that niche, you can do it very fast and very energy efficient. Okay. Um, then in, in the book, it goes from peristalsis and works its way up to more and more sophisticated ways of moving. It goes through slithering and all the ways of moving flat on uh, the ground. Um, reptilian and snake locomotion is fantastic. Snakes exhibit lots of different kinds of gates. Um, in my research lab, we play a game which is come up with a task that a snake can't do. They don't have opposable, not only do they not have opposable thumbs, they don't have thumbs, they don't have hands, they don't have arms. I apologize for all the herpetophobes in the audience, but I couldn't resist showing this recent gift that went around. Undulatory locomotion is fantastic. Um, almost loses it there at the end. Uh, snakes can climb trees perfectly fine. They can manipulate objects. They don't have an arm, but they are an arm. Lots of things that snakes, lots of things that snakes can do. Why did Mother Nature ever move away from snakes? If it's such a great solution, you can climb, you can move through the water, you can move over land, you can manipulate objects. Why didn't she stop there? Selective attention. Snakes are great in selective attention. You give them two different food sources that are moving at different speeds. You can play the minimal cognition game on snakes. Most of them will do perfectly fine. They don't move particularly fast. Okay, so we're restricting our discussion here to locomotion, right? They don't move particularly fast. If you're afraid of snakes, they move plenty fast. Yeah, there are some snakes that move like Now, again, that's subjective. There are animals that move faster than snakes. They're pretty susceptible to predators. They're pretty susceptible to predators in what sense? Uh, they're long. They're like, they're, they have a lot of body to like, attack. There's a lot of places to grab on, so that's, that's true. Let's restrict our thinking to just locomotion. This beautiful locomotion, these gates that snakes exhibit, plus the one I showed you in the video there, lots of ways they can move. There's, there's a cost that they're paying for those ways of moving. I was just going to say, going back to displacement, yep. the evolution of wings allows for organisms to travel much farther than the snake can. So there's oh. other... But That's it. So wings allow you to move a lot faster than snakes. Snakes move plenty fast, but there are lots of animals that move a lot faster. So the snakes are taking a hit in terms of overall displacement or overall speed. Where else are they taking a hit? Friction to the ground. Absolutely, right? If you're sliding your belly across the ground, there's a lot of friction, right? And that's generating heat and generally slowing you down. So there was a lot of there is a lot of strong selection pressure operating out there on animals that drag their body across the ground to get your body off the ground. 
especially if you're in deserts or hot environments, very important for uh, transpiration and heat exchange. But we're, again, restricting our discussion just to, uh, to that. So if you're dragging your body, uh, you're not very energy uh, efficient. Another one that's missed is if you're a reptile, your arms tend to be horizontal to your body, and generally you're moving in this direction. Whereas mammals, our appendages are moving vertically. Right? So if you're moving horizontally, you cannot exploit gravity to generate a pendulum. Right? Primates that are brachiating or bipeds that are walking, we are exploiting the fact that something goes down and then comes back up again. Much harder to do if you keep your arms at a horizontal, in, restricted to the horizontal plane. So just as an example, talking about lizards and snakes, we can already see that there is this sharp trade-off that's made between these four competing demands when you're get, trying to get from point A to point B. Okay. Now, let's have a look at this trade-off between displacement and energy. Um, there are some great experiments that have been done in which uh, we, you either place a mask on uh, an animal or place it inside a hood, and you can, you can measure VO2 max or how much oxygen an animal burns for a given speed. So you put the animal on a treadmill, set the treadmill to a speed hopefully that the animal can maintain, so you now know, based on the speed of the treadmill, exactly how fast the animal is going. And if it's wearing a mask and you're recording changes in oxygen, you know exactly how much oxygen the animal or the human is burning. So you now have a velocity measure, the treadmill, and you have an energy measure, the amount of oxygen that's being burnt. And you can compare these things to see what is the actual trade-off being made by the animal or the human between speed and energy. How much energy does it take the animal to move at a given speed? Doesn't that not take into account like humans' much greater ability to get rid of excess heat? Absolutely. So we're going to restrict our discussion, as you'll see in the moment, to just one species. Some of these plots, um, this one is for humans. We're just going to compare humans to humans, or a single human to a single human. So right. If we wanted to compare this across animals, we have to take into account other aspects like physiology. Okay. Simplest one is put a human on a treadmill and slowly turn up the speed of the treadmill and watch the human burn more and more calories as they go, burn more and more oxygen as they go. And you'll tend to get a plot that looks like this. Right? Without any instruction, at a slow setting of the treadmill, the human will walk. And as you turn up the treadmill, the speed of the treadmill, at some point, they will switch from walking to running. Why? Simplest answer is if you've ever been on a treadmill, it just feels more comfortable. Yeah, well, walking at a higher speed is more difficult than running at that exact same speed. Exactly. Walking at a certain speed, which is this speed here, you burn more if you walk at a treadmill going, or this person spent burn more energy at 2.1 meters per second on the treadmill uh, walking than they would have if they switched to running. Remember the previous lecture when I introduced the, the robot manipulating objects and I told you that when you have a body, magic things start to happen, which is a continuous world is continuous. Everything is different from everything else. But the moment you start to interact with things in your world, categories start to magically appear. Right? Certain things tend to feel similar to one another and feel very different from other things. The world starts to clump into discrete states. As we just saw in the previous example, that happens when you manipulate objects. But more importantly, it starts to happen when you move about. So whether you're a snake or a human, there are different ways, distinct ways of moving that feel comfortable within certain ranges of motion. You can um, exhibit a gait which is halfway between walking and running. So if you teach yourself, you can exhibit a series of gaits which are continuous between these but they don't feel comfortable. We like to do one or the other. So suddenly we have these two categories, which in this case are gates, walking and running. No one dictated that from above. It just falls out of the physics of legged locomotion. There is a theory um, in neuroscience that says the origins of categories, the very fact that we think about it belongs to A and B, 
fact that that exists comes from the fact that we move about. The world itself doesn't really have distinct categories. There's just masses of atoms. Some are more proximate to one another than others. There's a, a wash of continuous phenomenon out there in the world. But the moment you interact with that continuous wash of material out there, categories start to fall out. That is the main benefit of thinking about the body when we think about intelligent behavior. OK, so uh, we can see this very clearly uh, if we put a human on a treadmill. We can see other kinds of uh, trade-offs between energy and locomotion. So if we put someone back on a treadmill and we set the treadmill to go at 1.5 meters per second, and we then ask the human to walk at different frequencies, um, and you can try this out on your own, um, if you walk at a very high frequency with small steps, you got to maintain 1.5 meters per second. Or if you walk with a very low frequency where you're taking high amplitude steps, you'll start breathing heavily. Both are difficult. Taking a step at about one step per second feels comfortable for most people. Again, for taller or shorter people, it's not exactly one. But as you leave this classroom and you walk to your next class, count your steps and you will find that it's at about one hertz. There is something about that for six-foot-tall biped primates that that's, that's the energy minimum. If I want to move at 1.5 meters per second, this is the ideal frequency, more or less. Okay. So um, again, this magical property falls out of legged locomotion. Depending on what particular legged animal you are, you have more or less uh, gates. Um, so we're going to introduce a little bit of terminology now when we're talking about legged locomotion. Um, first one is stance phase. So a gait is sort of the overall property of the animal. If we look at a single foot during a particular gait, we can measure at a given point in time whether that foot is on the ground or not. That's the stance phase. So during a gait, is there at least one foot on the ground? Or if for some gaits, there is a flight phase in which all feet are off the ground. When we walk, there is no flight phase. When you're running, there is a flight phase. There's a portion of the gait cycle in which both of your feet are off the ground. Photography was originally invented, uh, not photography, but um, cinematography. Creating a movie was invented to try and answer the question about whether horses had a flight phase during trotting. If you watch a horse that's trotting or running, sometimes if you watch, it's very difficult to see if there's a moment in time in which all four feet came off the ground. So over 100 years ago, uh, the first movie was taken of a horse so that you could freeze a particular frame and see whether all feet were off the ground. It's a great story in the history of technology that has to do with trying to answer this, this question. Generally speaking, the faster the gate is, the greater fraction there is of a flight phase. Uh, we'll end today with this video, I think, or this GIF, uh, which is a great one to see the uh, five or six gates, depending on how you count for dogs. So you can see here the flight phase and stance phase. You can see the relative speeds of the gates. This is for dogs. There's more or less the same gates for horses. Some horses have a sixth gate. There's five gates. For some horses, there's a sixth one. Are there any horse people here? No? The Icelandic horse, a subspecies, is able to exhibit tolting, which is a sixth gate. Go check it out on YouTube. Um, you have a quiz due tonight. See you on Thursday.